Welcome to this talk. Um, my name is Patrick Jaya from uh, Tulki Engineering and uh, we are going to talk in this presentation about uh, Swift 2. Great. I begin um, <clears throat> perhaps with a quick word about me. Um, I've been doing um, lately um, projects in the Java, um, Groovy domain a bit of Scala also, and lately in the couple of last years, lots of mobile project <clears throat> with iOS, and of course I jumped also on the Swift um, language in 2014 when, when it was announced. Great, and I've got, got also a couple of projects uh, privately um, on iOS, and that is an example <clears throat> of an app I have built, uh, which is uh, about 80% or so um, uh, programmed in Swift. Great. And uh, don't hesitate to continue the, the discussion on Twitter. This is my uh, username on Twitter. Let me just ask you a couple of questions that, just to understand um, what is your background. Like, um, who of you knows already a bit of um, iOS? Okay, so a couple of people. Um, about Swift? Okay, great. Um, and who of you were at the talk about Kotlin uh, today? Also a couple of people. Okay, we are, we are going to start with a short comparison between Swift and Kotlin. Excellent. And other than that, Java programmers, almost uh, everyone, and Scala, two or three people, okay, great. What I'm going to do uh, in this talk, uh, first uh, do a quick introduction about the language, um, and then basically we'll go through various features of the language, uh, mainly from version 2. Uh, inside playgrounds. <clears throat> it's basically some kind of um, uh, sheet which is evaluated uh, live. We'll see that later. Great, so a quick um, overview about the language. So version 1 was announced in 2014 and released also uh, in summer 2014. Um, and uh, other than that, um, last year in summer also the second version 2.0. Right now we are at version 2.1 officially. Um, version 2.2 uh, is also interesting because it's uh, in beta uh, testing and it's the first version which is open source basically. Uh, where the, the, roadmap, the roadmap is public <coughs> um, it is possible to uh, make proposition and uh, uh, pull request on GitHub about that. And version 3 will be released uh, then in summer with uh, more uh, um, disruptive changes. Feature-wise, uh, most of the feature I will show today uh, like uh, better map filter and co uh, error handling, protocol extension and so on are available from version 2. Uh, one thing, value types are basically from the beginning of the language. So just to have a, um, a broad overview about that. What can we do with Swift? So basically Swift, um, uh, with it we can build apps for iOS. When I say iOS I mean also like tvOS and watchOS which are just like some small changes from the main iOS versions. Uh, other than that, of course, um, we can build things for OS X, like applications, but also command line tools and script. And from Swift version 2.2, the open source version, it's also, there is a runtime also for Linux, basically. Everything, the code, uh, basically we're going to have a look at uh, is available on GitHub. I will just tweet the link after the talk if you want to try it uh, uh, directly. 
Great. Uh, let's start by a quick comparison between Kotlin and Swift. Um, it's really interesting to see um, basically that the two languages have lots in common. Also, uh, with respect to the syntax, um, very interesting. So we see definitely uh, common grounds in, uh, um, between Scala, Kotlin and Swift. Let's have a closer look. So in Swift, if you want to define a mutable variable, you do it with the var keyword. str is mutable and uh, we can change it. What we see also, it's uh, type inferred, so basically we can just have a look at the type of str and it's correctly um, um, seen as a string, basically. We can also uh, define uh, constants with a let keyword. Seems like um, a pretty um, um, common features. Another thing also, of course, since the type is inferred, um, you just can call a method on some object which are uh, uh, <coughs> valid for the type. So basically has prefix is a method from string and as prefix two is not, so you would get an error. Exactly. Um, it's um, also interesting to see <coughs> that um, Swift has built into the, the language exactly like Kotlin optional types. And uh, interesting enough, uh, it's exactly the same notation. So we have here a function um, that is returning a string, basically an optional string because we have uh, the question mark here. Um, and we see here, we just, in this case, return a string and here return nail. We see here also like a default parameter. And um, I can basically call this guy either without parameter, in which case four will be taken or with a, a param some parameter like um, three or something. It's interesting also to note that um, a definition like this, <coughs> if I just return a string, is not legal in this case because nil is not a string. If you, uh, if a reference can be nil, it must be implemented as uh, optional type. I suppose this is exactly like in Kotlin. Great. Um, another similarity to Kotlin basically is uh, the possibility um, to extend uh, existing types. I, I can just like extend integer and uh, have my custom functions and have something like this. It's interesting to note also that as in Groovy or uh, in Kotlin, if um, the closure is the last parameter, we can just uh, omit the brackets. Um, and that allows to define constructs which look pretty much like keywords in the language. There is also a nice, um, yeah, basically um, syntax for properties. Like this, basically, uh, you get also getter set auto generated. <clears throat> and like that for reading. Great. There, there are a couple of differences, though. Like, of course, Kotlin is running on the JVM, uh, Swift is compiled to machine code, is running on iOS, OS X, and uh, Linux. 
Great, that would be for the introduction. Let's have a look now at uh, the feature of Swift 2. There is an interesting thing that was not possible in Swift 1, which, um, which is um, algebraic, a uh, possibility to do algebraic data types in the language. Let's have a look at that. So something that was not possible in the first version of the language was this uh, kind of definition, basically. What do we have here? Basically, we define an expression and we say in one case we would just uh, like to declare uh, a number. In the other case, we would have an operation which has a function here and also a uh, left-hand side and right-hand side expression. So this is new to Swift 2, uh, the possibility to declare recursively um, a value as the, the global type. For that, we just have to uh, add the, um, this keyword indirect. Great, and then we can just like uh, declare a couple of um, variable with that. like this and of course we can also declare a bit um, uh, expressions which are a bit more complicated this is, would be a shorthand for the binary plus operation and this for the uh, minus operation. And uh, so far we would just get um, the, the tree representation of the expression. Of course what we can do, this is not uh, proper to Swift 2, but we can just like um, define an evil uh, function here. So basically this would um, just look at the current item, if it's a number. This is also an example of pattern matching in Swift. If it's a number, we would just grab the number here in N and return it. And if it's an, um, an operation, we would also grab the different parts, like the, this is a function, the left-hand side and right-hand side, and do recursively the evaluation and then apply <clears throat> the, fu the function on uh, both uh, sides. Okay, so basically let's see if it's working. And we can effectively compute um, our value. Any questions so far? No question. Great, so let's go to the next uh, topic. <clears throat> Basically, uh, there was kind of an ugly um, syntax for a collection operation in Swift 1. This has been corrected since then. Um, let's have a look at that. For that, let me just um, declare two global functions. This will basically emulate the behavior uh, of Swift 1. So uh, the situation in Swift 1 was the following. <clears throat> we could um, use basically the map um, method on an array like this. But there was also another possibility to call uh, the same uh, uh, function, which was a globally declared function on collection type. 
this is sort of ugly because two ways to call the same thing and also for instance um, if we get a set like this then there was no um, map filter method and set we were um, <clears throat> we had to use the global function for that not nice also if you want to mix uh, the, these uh, these different methods then it becomes very ugly uh, and that's not a good thing so now everything is um, a lot more consistent so basically this was everything swift one let's let's uh, have a look now at uh, swift 2 <clears throat> So basically this would be uh, the call of the map method on array of int and if I declare a set now then I can also use um, the map method. This of course uh, is also interesting when we begin to uh, chain uh, the different uh, filter map and call methods like this. You can write something like this. Uh, this is um, a range which is also a collection type and everything is smoothly declared as um, as methods filter map reduce. I can just take all the, the items which are even, <coughs> map some value and then reduce by taking um, the, the sum of all items. Very smooth. and just like print the result at, at the end. Great! This is possible thanks to a protocol extension because before um, basically array was declaring map as a method and set was, was not and there was some um, as I said globally defined function which were were operating on um, collection type. Now, um, thanks to protocol extension, we can declare directly extend existing protocols. If you like, a protocol is basically like an interface <clears throat> um, in Java or a thread in Scala. Let's first uh, have a quick look at what is a protocol. So that would be a protocol. We define a method, some method, which is returning a string. Now, if I implement a class like this, which um, <clears throat> um, implements full protocol, of course I get an error because I don't implement some method. Of course, I could just implement uh, the method inside uh, foo or I could alternatively uh, choose to extend directly the protocol. Let's do that. <coughs> so what I'm doing here basically is <clears throat> we see first of all uh, foo does not um, gives us an error because now we basically introduced the implementation of some methods directly in the protocol. We also did implement another one um, and um, because of that then we can just call them let's first declare a foo object and of course now I can um, call either method like this. Okay, so that would be the basics of a protocol extension. Of course, we can uh, do a lot more things with it. Uh, <clears throat> like, for instance, we can have various conditions when the extension should be applied and when it should not be. Let's have a look at that. 
So um, let's take, for example, uh, an extension to collection type, like this one. So what we are uh, saying here is we extend a collection type. Uh, we have an additional condition here. Let's uh, come back to that later. And here we have a, um, a method sum, which is giving back the basic type of our collection. And inside it, we just reduce the items and, and go um, and get back the sum. The interesting part is here that this extension only applies if the basic type is an integer. And just for people cur curious about it, these are basically um, types which are defined within the collection, uh, the collection type protocol, basically. So um, what we could expect from that is, um, <clears throat> first of all, if I declare a collection type where the basic type is an integer, I can call the sum method. Of course, what I can also expect um, from that, let's see if it's, um, it's true. If I declare a collection where the basic type is not an integer, then I don't have the sum method. and we, we get effectively an error from the compiler. So that would be one possibility. We can operate uh, over the basic formulate condition over the basic uh, uh, item type. Another thing that we can also do um, is referencing uh, the particular type of the object we have in our hand. Let's have a look at that. Um, so basically here I'm also extending collection type. I uh, declare another method first higher where I just compare the first item of the collection. Uh, interesting enough is here the type self. What is self is basically if I've got a range of ints, uh, then I'm expecting this method to be visible or to be valid only if the parameter is also a range of ints. That's also an interesting thing. Uh, let's try that if it's working. So basically I can write that kind of things. This is valid because both uh, this object and this parameter are uh, of the same type. But this is also valid because we have here a range of int. Something which won't be uh, valid is that. Because we have here an object which is a, uh, an array of ints, and here it's a range of ints. So basically, it's not this, uh, both uh, times um, the same type. What also won't be valid, uh, let me have a quick look at, um, here. Exactly what also won't be valid is that if I declare an array of double and trying to call first higher, then um, first higher uh, using uh, yeah, perhaps I have to declare this one also at the same time int array. Then um, this is won't be um, legal because of the basic type is not the same. Great, so that would be for a protocol extension. <clears throat> 
Just to let you know, basically the, the extension keyword is not new to Swift uh, 2.0 and is also not new uh, to protocol or not proper to protocol extension. Uh, it's the, the basic possibility how we can extend either a class, a struct um, or also a protocol now. So this would be also a possibility, int is a struct and we can define new properties uh, on int and then we can uh, write things like this, for instance. This was all legal Swift 1 syntax so far. Great. Any question about uh, protocol extensions? Okay. Let's dive into um, <coughs> error handling. Basically, Swift 1 had exactly the same uh, error handling possibility like uh, Objective-C. Swift 2 added the, the possibility to throw and catch um, errors. Um, so let's have a look at that. Let's make room here. Great. How was the situation in, in uh, Swift 1? It was the following one. Of course, this code won't compile because we have here a playground uh, running Swift 2. What we had was basically <coughs> we were doing exactly like in Objective-C uh, declaring um, a variable here error set uh, set it to nil, and then when we were calling cost constructor or method which could fail, we would pass here error. And the, in this case, this would be uh, an in out parameter, and we would just like this is sort of also the way we use um, error uh, handling in C, we would just check if error was set or not. So that's, that would be Swift 1. Let's remove this, now Swift 2. Um, so basically now this <coughs> the syntax is a bit more uh, interesting what we can do, so this is exa exactly the same expression uh, than before. We use, uh, we call the regular expression constructor, and um, <clears throat> this could fail if this regular expression is not legal, in which case uh, we have different possibilities. With uh, this exclamation mark and try, we would just let the app crash if something went wrong which would uh, also be um, a legit case if we define uh, the expression because we know it's valid or it's not valid like. If um, we are not sure, in this case we can use uh, this syntax with a question mark. Interesting to note for instance here is, is also the difference in the return type. In this case here we get a regular expression not optional of course because if something is uh, goes wrong then the program crashes in this case basically we get something which is an optional regular expression because if this fails we just get nil back that's also a quite compact way to uh, express um, uh, a program which would uh, then look like this there are lots of cases, for instance, in Java, where we would write something like this. Um, no, sorry, uh, this is not what I wanted to show. This is the more compact form. It's this one. Okay. So basically what we are doing here is uh, wrapping a call this time without question or exclamation mark inside a do catch block. If something uh, goes wrong, we just return nil. So basically, except the error reporting here, we have got exactly the same case 
uh, with this compact notation. We get back nil if something goes wrong. And this would be, of course, the general case uh, with do catch, where we can have a couple of different of catch expression uh, matching the, the type of the error. And of course, what I wanted to show is basically this function could be uh, written in a more compact way like this, just like returning a try question mark something, some call. So that would be uh, it about um, uh, catching errors. Of course, it is also possible to execute a statement at the end of a, a given block, like finally in Java. Let's define these two functions. Then um, <clears throat> let's say we have um, a job function which which is opening some file. We can basically just right after opening the file, we can call uh, with a differ keyword uh, close file. It won't be uh, executed at this point, but only uh, at the end of the block. Let's see if it's working as we are uh, expecting. So basically, if I'm calling this guy like this, what I see is open file is called first, of course. We get zero here. Then second is this one, where we can we get uh, sequence number one. And at the end, we get a call to close file, as expected here. Any questions so far? Of course, it's quite easy um, to declare also own error types. I can just like de declare my error type like this. And uh, I'm able uh, then like to throw it. Interesting to note here is uh, this keyword throws. We don't declare which kind of error uh, we could throw. We just say we are maybe generating an error. And the call uh, would look like this. We need to include try here. Interesting to note is semantically, it's not exactly like in Java because we are not declaring the type, so we don't know which kind of error we can throw. Uh, so basically, it's exactly the same semantic than in Objective-C. If you, you know Objective-C, then you know, basically, we can get any possible error back. Maybe we get a particular error, but we, in any case, we need to catch the general error case that we can always get. So it's exactly the same. And um, it's also completely um, compatible with Ob Objective-C. Basically, the compiler would translate Objective-C error uh, handling codes in Swift when you call from Swift an Objective-C uh, method, for instance. So that's the reason why it's exactly the same. Great, so that would be it for um, regarding error handling. <clears throat> value types. Now that's interesting, value types. That's a feature which um, becomes also popular in uh, um, Java and that uh, kind of languages. Let's make room. First of all, what is a value type? So basically, we all know, for instance, like in Java, uh, native types like um, uh, int, uh, float, and so on, are passed by values. And the rest are just passed by reference. So value types 
just to sum it up in one phrase, is a complex type passed by value. Let's have a look at that. Something that we are uh, that we know about a value type for uh, a native. It's not native in Swift because everything is also a struct or a class. But let's uh, have a look at that anyway. So here we we have basically a parameter int. We need to declare it as variable because we change it inside uh, the the function. Let's call that. Of course, as expected, n is not modified <coughs> outside of the call, so is still one uh, after the call. Now, of course, you you uh, know uh, what means uh, passed by reference. If we define a more complicated type like this one. Notice here the keyword class. Then, if we declare some function like this, <coughs> and we modify the object we, uh, inside the function, of course, as we are expecting, Uh, we instantiate uh, an object, we modify it inside the, the function, and here it's still modified outside because it's passed by reference. That is all known. Interesting is that we can basically define um, a type with a struct keyword. <clears throat> it will also be a complex type. Let's do that with um, a structure person what we can notice here this is just saying um, uh, this type is convertible to string basically and here we have got two properties one which is mutable age and another one not mutable name and this is just like the string representation that we output So we can basically declare a couple of uh, persons here. And we could also try um, to modify an instance of a person inside a function like this. So what I'm doing here, it's very similar to before. I'm uh, declaring here <clears throat> a parameter var uh, because the object is mutated inside the function and I just double the age. Let's try to call that on P1. And let's see uh, what was P1 before and what it is after the call. Uh, of course, I have to, call, to use both times the same one. So what we see is basically uh, it is not uh, changed outside the call. It's quite interesting. <clears throat> um, lots of types are basically in Swift are implemented as uh, struct. Apple apparently loves that kind of behavior. So uh, the, all the basic types like int, double, and so on um, are value types, which makes actually sense because uh, we are used to this native uh, passed by, by value uh, semantic. Interesting is also that arrays, dictionaries, sets, and so on are also value types in Swift. And it's also not a bad thing regarding performance. So basically, if you make a test uh, uh, just trying to um, a sort a large array, you would get a better performance when you use a struct at the place of a class.
questions so far? Great. <clears throat> Last two uh, things I, I would like to show you is basically um, first um, the word statement. Let's make room here. Let's begin uh, by declaring <coughs> a class like this. As you would notice, uh, both properties are optional. Could also be nil. Uh, what you had to do with Swift1, if you wanted to execute a function uh, and check if both name and age were set, you would end up with um, code like this. So this what was called uh, the pyramid of doom. So this is just for like two properties. If you've got four, like, like you get uh, code which is not readable at the end. So this one was um, Swift one. In uh, Swift uh, one two. There is already <coughs> a better syntax for that, which is uh, the following. You could already uh, have various let assignments inside the same if. So basically you could uh, just write that and here you had name and age set. If we check the type, we see it's a string, it's not an optional uh, like um, this one. It's already a lot better and Swift 2 is one um, degree better than that. Uh, it's this, this code is still valid of course in uh, Swift 2. There are cases where it's uh, interesting to use and this would be early exit with Word. So basically what we are doing here <coughs> is just like doing two assignments um, of name and age. If one of them is not set, we just uh, call uh, the else uh, block, in which case we return. We could also print some, some things or do some things here. And here uh, we've got non-optional types and there is less, uh, you know, um, um, f let's say um, the brackets are less uh, nested, so it's basically more readable than uh, this this one here, for instance. Great. That would be it about guard statement. And I think I just have the opportunity to, to check the pattern matching. Perhaps uh, let me ask you a question. Any, any questions so far? If there is a question, I can just um, jump on it. And if not, then I would um, present the last um, uh, topic. Great. So let's have a look at pattern matching. There is basically a cleaner syntax for pattern matching inside, or let's say an extended um, syntax inside um, if and for. Let's have a look at that. First of all, let's uh, declare an enum like this. <clears throat> And uh, let's um, have an instance of it. Something which is new in Swift 2 is this uh, possibility to pattern match directly value uh, inside an if. If you see that, if case, 
this is directly pattern matching. This is quite a weird syntax at uh, the right. <clears throat> we see with equal a, basically. Interesting enough, it's also legal to write uh, to write it like this just to uh, uh, to compare it. Basically, I can have the let here or inside uh, the my mm definition. Regarding the for statement, if I declare a collection of nms, for instance, like this, the standard way to, uh, or let's say the, the possibility to iterate through it with for is this one, this is standard stuff. Now I can also pattern match inside the for, like this. So basically here I also get the case directly here and here I'm getting the, the assignments to S. So basically although I've got four items in the collection I've got just one string str and here I've got uh, only one a loop uh, iteration. And of course I can pattern match basically also more complicated things if I define a collection like this one <clears throat> and this would will be the last example I can write um, code like this so basically here I will just iterate through, through the items and here I would pattern match this time it's a range so here I would go inside this uh, part here if number is between 1 and 10 uh, inclusive and so on. Here we've got another range and so, uh, and so on. Any questions so far? That would be the uh, new features regarding pattern matching in Swift 2. If you want to um, to have a look at the the code example, don't hesitate to go there. I will push the last changes I did before the presentation. And there is also I wrote uh, a couple of blog posts. If you uh, want to look at that, also regarding Swift One, you can go to uh, the Tulke blog. Just look for Swift, uh, and you will find it. Excellent. Then thank you very much.